Good morning again. How's everybody doing? It was a crazy week, right? Again, the weather is just kind of off, and I guess it was appropriate for February, but still, it seemed weird to me. It wasn't even good snow. It wasn't good snow for like making anything. It was just kind of dry and annoying. Um, hopefully not like the sermon will be, so there you go. Um, no, I hope you, you got everything you needed uh, before uh, the big freeze and the big snow came in, which that's a funny kind of thing to wish for people, right? I hope you got everything you needed, everything you needed. Complex people we are when it comes to our needs, right? Most creatures just need like food, water, shelter. We need clothing, and, and then you'd think we'd be good, but we're not. We have a lot more needs than that. In fact, there was a guy named Maslow. I hope that was his last name. But there was a guy named Maslow who actually created a hierarchy of needs for human beings. He studied this. And at the bottom, there are all those basic things that we just talked about, but there's also things like purpose, love, affection. Cows don't worry if they're going about their life being like, am I doing what my father's called me to do? Or rather, is my, am I doing what my father's called me to moo? <laughs> yeah, there we go. Now we're on fire. Cows don't worry about whether or not they're making the bull that sired them proud of them. We do. Dad tells you he loves you and he's proud of you. It means the world to you. Cow doesn't care about that. So what we need to be aware of as we spend our time together today is that there are needs that we have of which we are unaware. And the reason why I know we're unaware of them is, one, there's a guy who spent his life making a hierarchy. If it's understood, you don't need to do that. If it's basic, you don't have to do it. No, 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 no. There are things that we need that we're not aware we need them. And I would argue today as we kind of move through our sermon series on prayer, on patterns of prayer, today we're talking about forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. I would argue that forgiveness is a need that we have, a need to receive it and a need to extend it. So what I want us to do today is I want us to talk about how forgiveness can actually change your life, how praying for forgiveness can change your life. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. It's where we'll start. Then we're going to go over 18 for a while, and then we're going to go back to Matthew 6. So kind of keep your thumb over there. But what I want us to talk about is how, or sorry, what is uh, forgiveness? How do we pray for forgiveness? And then how do we extend it to other people? So first, what is forgiveness? Verse 12 Matthew 6, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. So one of the things that I haven't talked about much, I'm, I'm, maybe Jeff has, I haven't talked about much is where the, the Lord's Prayer finds itself in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount. Because that's where we are in the passage. That's where we are in Scripture. This is Jesus' most central teaching. This is what we know Jesus for as far as his teachings go. And a lot of people consider the Lord's Prayer to be the high point, the pinnacle, the climax of the Sermon on the Mount. So what's the Sermon on the Mount about? Jesus, unfortunately, doesn't have a a clever introduction, three points, and then a clever conclusion. Jesus probably wasn't Baptist. I know. I'm alarmed too. What's the Sermon on the Mount about A lot of different ideas on that. My favorite, my personal favorite is uh, that it's about flourishing. It's about living your life in such a way that you will will flourish and the people around you will flourish and there'll be growth and maturity. You'll do that thing. You'll be the person that God's created you to be. If that's what you want to be, you live like the Sermon on the Mount has called you to be. And so if the Lord's Prayer is a part of that sermon, then the Lord's prayer is really how do I pray in such a way that leads to flourishing for me and for those around me? And this is Jesus' teachings on it. And so this is a structure, a prayer that, yes, it reaches out to God, but also a prayer where God reaches into us and changes us and matures us. And so it shouldn't be a big surprise that forgiveness is a big part of this prayer. Because one of the core components of our relationship with the Lord is confession and repentance. 
Because as soon as you enter into this world, as soon as you're born, you enter into a state of need of forgiveness. As soon as your life begins in the womb, you're in need of forgiveness, of pardon from God, mercy, as we just sang. This is due to original sin. Original sin, it's not necessarily anything you've done, it's a condition you're born into. It's a, it's a genetic human disorder that we've inherited from Adam and Eve, passed down through the generations. And what it looks like, you can explain it in all sorts of different ways, but for our purposes today, the best way to describe sin and original sin and brokenness is the way Paul describes it. Even when there's good things I want to do, I still don't do them. I'm selfish, newsflash. I want things that make me happy. I want things that make me comfortable. And frankly, sometimes I'm not even worried what that costs and who that costs. Right? That's sometimes how we operate in life. Now, yes, after millennia of being in society together, we've recognized that living together in community requires us to maybe push down some of our selfish desires for the betterment of community. But even that's selfish because I get things out of that. I don't have to worry about somebody busting into my house and taking my stuff because they're stronger than me. Because we've all agreed to live under a set of laws. That's not generous, that's self-interested. You obey your laws, you keep your stuff. I obey the laws and I keep my stuff. We both win. Also, I'm not that strong. So I really need that law. My body rewards me for doing things that feel good, look good, and taste good. There's a reason why chicken fried sandwiches are amazing. Because they are. And my body wants them constantly. And it rewards me with this little thing called dopamine whenever I eat one. It's like, oh, that's good, eat it again. But really, we all know the fried chicken sandwich is doing what? It's killing me. I don't care. (laughs) I do not make good choices. It's because of brokenness, it's because of sin. It's because of evil. And this is where we need Forgiveness. Because my instinct is not to choose flourishing. It's to do what feels good, tastes good, looks good for me, and maybe the people around me, my tribe, the people I identify with. My best efforts at flourishing, even if on a good day, my best efforts could still go awry. Think about it. You give $20 to a guy on the street who's asking for money. What are you worried about in the back of your mind? He's going to go and buy something that's going to hurt him. Or hurt herself. And so what do we do? Like, well, I'm not going to give it. Or we give it, and then that person actually goes and does the thing we're worried about. They overdose and they die. Your best intentions went awry. Our best intentions often do that. And this is why we need Jesus. Think about this. Jesus Christ is the only person to ever walk the face of the earth that everything he ever did led to flourishing for himself and the people around him. Nothing he ever did was destructive, with the exception of that fig tree that he withered, but that was a teaching point, and it led to flourishing. His his words, his actions, it all led to growth, growth and produce for people. And this is why we need forgiveness. We need forgiveness from the one who all flourishing comes from, all joy and all mercy comes from. This is why we need to to ask for the inexhaustible grace of God, mercy and grace from Jesus Christ who suffered and died so that we might have forgiveness. Forgiveness is a need. It's a need you have from your God because we are alienated from him unless we've accepted Christ. So there's really only two options you have. You can say, you know what? I made the mistakes, I messed up, God, I'll take the punishment. That is, in some weird way, honorable, I guess. It's foolish. Because you can't bear that punishment. You can't live that life. You can't pay that debt. It'll end with your destruction. On the other hand, you can say, Father, your word tells me that Jesus Christ died to pay away the whole debt. And so by faith, I'm just gonna believe that. I'm gonna trust that my debt's paid by somebody else and I have to take your word for it. 
That's called salvation by grace through faith. And it's the only way to achieve forgiveness, to have that right relationship with God. So forgiveness isn't just nice to have. It's an absolute need we have. It's central to who you are as a person. And what's more is it's a daily need. Look back at the text, verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. That's one sentence. That's a conjunction there. That idea of daily can be extended both to the bread and to the need for forgiveness. Now, I'm not talking about you need to keep going back to God again and again and again and again and again to be saved for this eternal security, salvation kind of thing. It's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fact that we need confession and repentance in our daily lives. It's a daily need. Because what happens is when you go to God and ask for forgiveness, it's like the tiller that breaks up the hard soil of your heart and allows grace and mercy to be planted in the soil so that it might take root and it might grow into a bountiful trees of mercy and grace that are then extended to other people. Forgiveness and confession and repentance, seeking that from God, that's what breaks up that hard dirt of your heart. You see, many of us are aware of our major vices and failings, our addictions, right? I've heard Jeff talk about this before, and in my experience, I've seen it to be true as well. I rarely have anybody come into my office and confess, frankly, anything. But when they do, it's usually something like, I'm addicted to pornography. Or I'm, 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 struggling, with, I'm struggling with drinking too much alcohol. I've never had somebody come in my office and say, Travis, I'm greedy. Travis, I'm a grown person and I do not honor my father and mother. Travis, I'm worried about how often I'm taking the Lord's name in vain. I'm concerned. I'm convicted. People don't confess covetousness. We typically only seek forgiveness from God when we commit an overt act of sin that we deem big enough. It's rare that anybody would confess greed. Typically the only time anybody will confess greed is if they get caught embezzling and they were like, yeah, I guess I was greedy. You think? Confess the greed before you embezzle, not after. Someone may confess covetousness after they steal something from somebody. Our hearts, our minds, they run rampantly wild, unfettered. And as long as we don't act on it, we think there's not a need for forgiveness. But that's not what scripture teaches. That's not what Jesus teaches in the very sermon we're in the middle of. He says if you look at somebody lustfully in your heart, you've committed adultery. That's an act. If you're angry, if you hate your brother or sister, you've committed murder. That's an act. You need forgiveness. If you kill someone, you should confess it. I I may be the only person in this room who struggles with this, but I find often my heart and my mind are on full tilt going after whatever thoughts and whatever desires they want. Now, just because I don't act on them, you think, oh, well, that's great. No. There are days where my heart and my mind are difficult to wrangle. And frankly, I get tired of doing it. You get worn down. We need a God that we can go to, that we can confess and repent and rest in. To think you only need confession and repentance for major things is like eating bread on Sunday and expecting to be full all week. It's not how it works. You wonder why we're hungry for God. You wonder why God feels distant. I don't think it's because we're sitting here on a bunch of unconfessed sin. I don't think that's how God works. I think it's because because we, we have parts of ourselves that we're keeping secret from God, we're withholding from him. We refuse to be vulnerable before him because we live in North Dallas. The land of the facade, the land where we show ourselves to be one person, but secretly inside we have anxieties and fears and worries, or even worse, we're somebody else completely at home. And we bring that same attitude into our prayer life with the Lord if we pray at all. And God says, great, I'm glad you're here. When the real you gets here, let me know. We want God to be close, but we also want him to be at arm's length. We want control of the relationship. That's not how God works. And you think about forgiveness in this way as a daily need, as a daily need that you have, then it would make sense why forgiveness 
is needed to be extended to other people. If you have a need of forgiveness, that means everybody else does too, right? So I should extend forgiveness to other people. But what we do is, and we recognize it as a need almost subconsciously, because when I withhold forgiveness from somebody, I'm wanting to hurt them, right? I want them to feel my pain. In, uh, in the ancient world and, and even in the medieval world, if you were going to war with another country, another kingdom, uh, you would need to conquer. If you wanted to conquer them, you need to take over their cities. Well, they had these annoying things called walls. And so you could send your soldiers over the walls and all be killed, or you could surround the city and lay siege to it and starve them out. Let disease and hunger take over, and then eventually they'll just stumble out of the city and it's yours. There's nobody left, but it's yours. But the danger in doing this is that the army that's at rest surrounding the city is also vulnerable to raids, to infighting, to disease from the water that they're drinking because, frankly, they didn't have a good understanding of germ theory. So they would use the bathroom in the same water they would drink. Gross. And they get sick. When you refuse to forgive somebody, you are laying siege to their heart. Rather than arguing with them, rather than fighting them, you are holding a, a root of bitterness in your heart and you're saying, they're gonna suffer, they're gonna feel my pain, they're gonna, they're gonna feel my hurt, and they very well may, but here's the thing. You are also at risk, at danger of yourself being starved out of the very forgiveness you need. You're vulnerable to the very poison you're trying to point, put into somebody else. Forgiveness is a need. It's a need we have. That's what forgiveness is. And until you see it in your life as a need, you won't make it a part of your worship with the Lord. You won't make it a part of your worship uh, with other people. So prayer obviously is a core part of this. We're in a sermon series on prayer. So I wanna talk about how do we pray for forgiveness. And for that, we're gonna look at Matthew 18 because we've talked about how there's a direct correlation between our attitude toward forgiving others and our pursuit of forgiveness. So what does this look like in our prayer life? So if you're like me, I don't have a hard time necessarily praying for uh, confessing and repenting on some things, but the ones I do have a hard time with are things that I've repeatedly made mistakes on. I have a hard time going to the Lord on that because I feel like he's standing there kind of with his arms crossed and being like, Travis, you've yelled at your kids six times this week, you've confessed it six times, like really, you want a seventh? Like what's wrong with you? Stop yelling at your kids. I'm like, but have you met them? No, I'm just kidding. And you know what that tells you about God? Nothing. Do you know what it tells you about me? Don't cross me seven times or I'll be angry. Like, really? Because that's, that's my, I'm, I'm not imposing the image of God into my life. I'm making God in my image because that's the way I am. Somebody crosses me enough and I get tired of forgiving them for it. It's not who God reveals himself to be. That's who I reveal God, who I, who I think God is. So I need scripture to come in and to tell me who God is. I, really, I need the revelation of God to tell me who he is. And that's what Matthew 18 does. And so it seems to be a series of unconnected stories and teachings, but they're not. They're all kind of revolved around this idea of forgiveness. So how do we pray asking God for forgiveness? What, what are the, what, practically, how does this work? Well, first, I would say be like a child. Verse 1 of chapter 18. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. So if ever there was a passage of scripture that affirms you playing with Legos and board games, this is it. Go for it. I, I, I take it that way. But seriously, the rest of Scripture looks at maturity as this goal to reach, right? It's always about maturity, about growth, about growing in grace. Paul talks about leaving behind the things of children when he became a man. Like that's kind of the running theme of Scripture, except for here. Here Jesus tells us to be like children. Why? Well, think about the question he's answering. Who is the greatest? So his disciples have come to him. They were laying out their resumes before him, saying, Lord Jesus, you've invested in all of us for X number of years. Who's got the best resume? What's the RO, who has the best ROI here? And Jesus says, give me a child. Children don't have resumes. They don't operate on return on investment. Do you know it costs $15,000 a year to raise a child? 
one child, $15,000 a year. And guess what? That's not like a monetary investment. I'm not planning on my kid like making more money to pay me back, right? Don't student loan your child. That just, that's terrible. No. Children, though, are priceless. They're valuable. You couldn't put a price tag on my kids. You could not give me any amount of money for one of them. Strangely enough, though, I will pay someone else to watch my kids for me. <laughs> it's kind of an odd thing when you think about it. Kids don't work on their resumes. You know what they want? They want your love. And when they mess up, they want your forgiveness. Kids are humble. They're fun that way. They're humble. Jesus is saying when you approach him, when you approach the father, you leave your resume at the door. You don't say, God, I need forgiveness for this one thing, but first, look at all these great things I did this week. No. God, I'm not gonna do it ever again. No. It's a resume. It's a resume talk. You know what you do when you go to God for forgiveness? You approach him the same way a 16-year-old kid would approach a loving father that just wrecked his car. Dad, I screwed up and I need help. Dad, I messed up and I need help. And you have a good father in heaven who wants to make sure you're okay, Right? When you call your parent and you say, hey, I wrecked the car, what's the first question a good parent will ask? Are you okay? And then let's talk about damages and insurance and the 94 Accord you're gonna have to drive to work from now on. Come to him, just approach him. And Jesus specifically says he won't turn away people who approach like kids. Kids are trusting. It's the reason why Christmas and losing a tooth are so magical. Be like a kid, trust him. And then he says that he wants you to see him. Look at uh, verse 10 of chapter 18. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 who never went astray. So is it not the will, so it is not, sorry, so it is not the will of my father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. The parable of the lost sheep, right? We talk about it all the time. And we think this means that when, when somebody comes to Christ for the first time, they're the lost sheep, and now they're found and they're brought back. Great. I think that's perfectly applicable here. But why do we think that God only celebrates on that first initial act of repentance, and then after that he's like, mm, no, you did what you were supposed to do, or you didn't do what you are supposed to do, and I don't care. Why do we think he treats us so coldly after we repent after that first act of repentance? I don't know if you know this, but, but sheep that get lost don't stay found. Sometimes the same sheep that wanders off can wander off again. And again, I'm not talking about losing salvation here. I'm talking about I can go astray from the Lord for a minute, for 30 minutes, for two hours, for a week, for several years, for decades even. Wandering, lost. And again, I'm not talking about eternal salvation. I'm just talking about not walking with the Lord. And do you think that when you're lost in that way, you come back, when you're astray, I love how it says astray, it doesn't say lost. Lost has a lot of weight to it. Astray is nice. When you stop being astray and the, and the Lord brings you home, do you not think he rejoices still? Every time you come back, do you not think he's excited about it? Of course he is. Of course he is. He wants you to see him. The next thing he wants you to do is to keep coming back. Verse 21 then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Peter asked a great question. How often do I have to look like an idiot if I'm giving people forgiveness? How long can people take advantage of me? The rabbi said three. And so G Peter's smart here. He's like, I'm gonna double it. I'm gonna add one. It's gonna be Jesus' favorite number seven and I'm gonna be a hero. And what does Jesus say? Mm, maybe just don't count. Like that's how many times you forgive somebody. I know he says 77, but really who's like, oh, you lied to me for the 68th time. I only got nine more to go. Nobody does that. 
Hopefully you don't do that. Jesus is saying, you forgive and you don't keep track. Now, where does he get this idea from? Do you think Jesus like picked this up from like another rabbi? He overheard him teaching. He's like, man, that's a good idea. I'm gonna borrow that. I'm gonna give him credit. You know where Jesus gets this idea from? Himself. This is how he works, right? If Jesus is telling us, when somebody wrongs us and they come back and ask for forgiveness, you forgive them an inexhaustible amount of time. Don't even keep track of it. Don't you expect him to live by the same direction that he's giving his disciples? Like, isn't the whole thing following Jesus, implying that he does it too? Is Jesus a hypocrite? Is he saying, you live this way and I'll do my own thing? No. Jesus forgives inexhaustibly. He didn't keep track of it. You go to him and you say, Jesus, I messed up again for like the 900th time. And he's like, oh, let's talk about it. I love you. I forgive you. Now, with that being said, there is a component of repentance. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about repentance. Verse 15, if your brother sins against you, go to him and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. What if they don't change? What if people keep trying to hurt me? These are fair questions. They're practical questions. And we live in a practical world, right? And these questions really revolve around the idea of repentance and accountability. Jesus says, if someone won't recognize their need for forgiveness and won't correct their pattern of behavior, you bring other people around, not necessarily people to gang up on them, but people who are gonna help them see how their ways are not leading to flourishing for you and for themselves. These people are there to help them not make the same mistakes again and again and again. That's what they're there for. This is accountability in play. In our case, many of us have repetitive patterns of sin. A lot of us think addictions, but it doesn't have to be an addiction to be a repetitive pattern of sin, I guess. Not in the way we think of addiction. Some of us have short fuses. That's our temperament. Some of us get angry when we drive. Some of us spend our money on frivolous things. Some of us, if we have a bad day, we eat too much. Some of us, if we have a good day, we eat too much. Some of us, if we don't care, we just eat too much. That's me. I like to eat. We need accountability in our lives. Repentance is like receiving the gift of forgiveness that God is giving you and promising you'll take care of it. What if somebody gave you an expensive piece of jewelry every Christmas and before the next Christmas rolled around, you lost that piece of jewelry? What would that say about how much you cared about the jewelry? It would say little about it. You didn't care much about it at all. Repentance is the way of telling the Lord I'm gonna take care of this gift of forgiveness. I'm gonna plant it deeply in my heart. I want it to take root so it'll sprout and grow and, and, and produce grace and mercy in my own life that I might extend it to myself and extend it to other people. We need accountability. If you struggle with pornography, you need somebody to help you with that. You need a computer program, something. It's like 100 bucks a year. It's worth it. If you can't afford it, let me know. I'll help you. If you struggle with managing your finances, you spend it on frivolous things, get someone to watch your finances for you. You can't be trusted right now. Doesn't mean you can't be trusted again, it just means right now. And you might say, well, Travis, that's really invasive. What do you think forgiveness is? It's the most invasive thing in the world. It goes into your heart, changes who you are. That's invasive. Having somebody knowing your search history or Knowing what you spend your money on, that's not invasive compared to forgiveness. Not at all. And it's worth it. So seek out that accountability. Repentance is not this, I'll never do it again, I'll never make the mistake again. That's not what repentance is. Repentance is, perhaps I'll try to not do it again. I have every intention of not making this mistake again, God. If I had a magic wand, I would never, ever, ever do this again. That's what repentance is. Repentance is saying, I'll make every effort not to make the same mistake again. Repentance is saying, I'm gonna make something in my life that makes it harder for me to do this, whatever it is.
lastly today, how does forgiveness, how does prayer actually help me forgive other people? How does prayer help me forgive other people? Go back to chapter six and look what Jesus says in 14 and 15. He says, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. This is the only part of the Lord's prayer that requires commentary. Nothing else, Jesus comments on nothing else. I should tell you two things. One, it's important. If Jesus takes a minute to say something about it, it's important. But two, it tells you that it's not intuitive. You don't have to explain things to people that they understand. So he's explaining this to us. Prayer very simply helps us learn to forgive other people because we spend time with someone who has more right to hold a grudge against us than anybody else. If Jesus can forgive us for all the things that we've done, we can forgive things of other people as well. God has every right to withhold forgiveness from us, to punish us with silent treatment or worse, but he doesn't. In fact, he goes beyond and he actually punishes himself, punished his son in order to forgive us. So this tells you something about forgiveness. It tells you why forgiving other people is so stinking hard. Because it hurts. It hurts. You know who it hurts? It doesn't hurt the person being forgiven. It's a blessing for them. It hurts the person doing the forgiving. If Jesus died so that we could have forgiveness, it tells us that in forgiving another person, it's gonna cost us pain in our own life. It's gonna be difficult for us. Something's gonna have to be sacrificed. Forgiveness isn't balancing the books. It's wiping them clean at your expense. That's what forgiveness is. And that's why it's so hard. Because we all know that. And it seems a lot easier to lay siege to their heart and get them to give up rather than paying their debt yourself. But when I see, spend time with Jesus and I understand what he's done for me, then I start to realize, wow, being like Christ means suffering too. It means being willing to suffer so that somebody else can walk in forgiveness. When that grace, when that mercy takes root deep in your heart and it sprouts that tree of grace and mercy, you're able to take the fruit from it, fruit that's in your life, fruit of forgiveness, and give it to other people. And they get grace and mercy in their life. People can come and rest under the shade and the branches of the tree of Christ in your life. It's planted there as a dead tree, the cross of Christ. But it blossoms as a living tree of grace and mercy in your life and the life of other people. And that's what forgiveness is. And it hurts. We all need it. Every single one of us needs it desperately. We need to hear it from each other. We need to hear it from God. And you get it from him in prayer. You go to him and ask for it. You go humbly you go expecting him to be happy to see you. You go with a heart of repentance and you keep going back. And the longer you spend with him, the more willing you are to forgive people for their sins and their failings in your life. And I'm not just talking about, oh, they stepped on my toe or they forgot to answer a text message. I'm talking about the big stuff that I go to therapy because of this stuff. That's why we need to spend time with God. We're gonna enter into a time of confession and repentance, silent confession and repentance before the Lord. And then we're going to take the Lord's Supper together. But I will say this. If you have something in this, somebody in this room, maybe you're watching at home and you have somebody in your house that you're at odds with right now. Maybe you guys fought on the way to church this morning or you fought on your way to the couch or whatever it was. Now's the time. Don't leave this room without seeking forgiveness. Nobody's going to be bothered by you moving around and, and seeking forgiveness. Maybe it's just reaching over and taking a hand and squeezing it, mouthing, I'm sorry. You'll work out the details later. But don't take this, don't let that cross your lips today. There's somebody near you that you can seek forgiveness with before. So let's spend some time in prayer and confession, repentance, and then we'll take the meal together.